thank you very much. So yes, um, I'm taking a different twist on this. So we had several talks now when we saw kind of using machine learning AI for optimization. I'm kind of looking at using our classical optimization tools for machine learning and AI. <laughs> so we are going to, I'm going to, in this lecture, I'm going to briefly cover how to find adversarial examples of deep neural networks using MIP. And specifically, I want to talk a little bit about how can we use these adversarial examples in the training process to fine tune deep neural networks. And so my goal is to show to you that classical tech optimization techniques, basically MIP and nonlinear programming, that is also highly relevant for AI. And I want to show that by very simple techniques, we can greatly improve robustness of neural networks. And I don't pretend to have all the answers here. Like many of these things are high, highly relevant problems, but I I have, we have an idea of how to solve them, but we definitely don't have the best thing figured out. So these are really open challenges. And it, this is kind of based on two lines of research, kind of embedding value deep neural networks into MIPS that it was done together with Ruth Meissner, Calvin Say, and Alexander Tebelt at Imperial College, and also about robust training that I've been working on together with Julian Sao, who is a postdoc at KTH. It's based on the following papers. I added links to all of these that you can click on. A small, a small disclaimer, this, this is really fresh off the print. We submitted this on Friday. <laughs> so it was a bit stressed to have to, to make sure that I have something that you can access if you want to. Yes, uh, I want to make a bit of advertisement before we start. There is going to be a MIP computational competition also this year. So details on this will follow, but I think this is highly relevant for all of you. Based on what you have learned in this summer school, you should have you should be in a fairly good position to compete in this. Once I get back to my office, I will try to make a public announcement of this and, and spread the information about it. Um, also, advertisement. I'm often searching for postdocs and PhD students, so send me an email if you're interested. And also, since I'm advertising, I also like to mention, take a look at our solver shot if you're interested in MI Nautic. Okay, that's enough on that. So let's continue with what we're actually talking about. So first of all, I want to motivate, why should you care about robustness? Why is this an important thing? Well, and, and this is nothing new. This is well known that, for example, deep neural networks, that they are sensitive towards adver adversarial perturbations. And what does this mean? Well, basically it means that the neural networks, they, are, they can be extremely easy to fool. So if you, let's look at what I mean by fooling them. So here we have, in this box, we have a, a neural network that we have trained, we have used all the bells and whistles to train this as, as good as we can to classify cats. So we feed a picture of a cat. It tells us that, okay, with a very high confidence, this is a cat. But if someone then comes and messes with our picture and does like a very small perturbation to our picture, well, you can't really see a difference here, but trust me, like there's all the pixels are mixed with a little bit. If you feed this into our same awesome neural network, it will be classified as a car. And this isn't so bad if you are developing an app for taking pictures of cats and doing classification on them, then this kind of mistakes doesn't really matter. But this, is, this gets serious when we are talking about, for example, self-driving cars. So these are pictures from this uh, ACOLT paper that I recommend that you read if you're interested in this topic. So they did, they did this kind of in real life. They had a neural network that was trained to recognize traffic signs. They went out and put basically pieces of tape on the stop signs, kind of resembling graffiti in a way. And these are all wrongly classified as something else. So these are not recognized as stop signs. And I wouldn't react if I saw, for example, a stop sign looking like that. That's kind of normal that someone puts a sticker or something on it. 
So what I want to say is this is a real safety concern when we are using neural networks in practice. And by robustness, then we don't want, basically what we don't want is we, if we have it classifying a picture correctly, then we don't want it to be possible to change that classification by just making a tiny perturbation to it. I'm presenting all of this from an image classification perspective, but there, it doesn't need to be images. So we can have different metrics here and different perturbations. So what I mean here, for example, here we have an original, a picture of a nine, which is classified as a nine. If we say that we can do a small perturbation in the L1 norm less than or equal to four, we will do a perturbation like that that changes it into a number four actually. And here, similarly with, with an infinity norm, this will also be classified as number four. So with different norms, you kind of get different features there. But let's formally look at what I really mean by when I talk about robustness. So assume we are, have a training data set where xi, these are the inputs, and yi, that's the correct classification of that input. And let's then assume that we have a neural network that we have trained. It performs relatively well, and it's able to classify a subset of the training data correctly. Typically, we can't make it classify absolutely everything correctly, but it can be a big part of the training data. So what I mean then by saying that the neural network is robust, well, basically, if we take any picture or any input from this data set of correctly classified images, then we can't make any of those misclassified by slightly, slightly adjusting it. That's the only thing that I'm saying. Okay, so if you can't do that, then I mean that the neural network is robust. Typically, you can find something that's perfectly robust, but more robust kind of means that there are fewer images that you can disturb to make it misclassified. So how can we check if a neural network is robust? Well, truth be told, that's actually a quite difficult task. It's not Typically, it's easy to say that it's not robust. You just find a counterexample and then you're done. But actually, verifying that it is robust is a bit tricky. But here, we can use mixed integer, basically mixed integer linear programming to check if it is robust. And if it's not robust, we can also find the perturbation that causes the misclassification. So MIP is very useful, which I don't think I need to convince you over. So let's continue and look at how we can encode deep neural networks as mixed integer programs. I think everyone is familiar with what a, with, with what a neural network is, but we just have some inputs, we feed them through the nodes, where we take a weighted sum, apply a nonlinear transformation through it, and pass it on through the network. And here I want to be clear that when we talk about Verifying robustness, for example, then we are not looking at modifying the weights of the neural networks. The thing we consider as variables are then the input to the neural network, how we slightly change the picture, for example, a little bit. And typically when we want to, what you typically want uh, try to do when we try to find an adversarial example is we try to maximize the confidence in in an image being classified as something else. And that in this case, we could, for example, maximize output one minus output two. If this becomes positive, it means the input is classified as output one. <laughs> it is a bit abstract here. OK. But now, if you just look at a single node here in the network, and here we're going to look at neural networks that have the so-called ReLU activation function, which is just the maximum of a affine function and zero. Uh, we can use different activation functionals and, and represent it as a mixed integer linear program, but for simplicity, I'm gonna stick with the ReLU activation function. And let's see how we can express this as a mixed integer program. 
this is not kind of the typical way of deriving the formulation, but this is at least how uh, I think about this in my head. So I think this is the most intuitive way. Some of you may not agree. Um, so the way I think about this is I think about the node as a disjunctive constraint of this form. Either the output is zero, then this linear, we get also have this linear constraint, but the way the affine function needs to be negative, less than or equal to zero. On the other side, we have the output y being positive and y given by the affine function. So either this, these constraints or these constraints, either one of them needs to hold. So let's see how we can express this as a mixed integer program. So this is just copied from the previous side. Uh, I will slightly rewrite the constraints. I'm not changing anything. I'm just writing the equality as two inequality constraints. So I'm splitting this up into two parts. And now I'm going to introduce two binary variables, one sigma zero for this part and one sigma one for this part. And I'm going to use these as indicators. If, this, if sigma zero is one, then I'm going to force these constraints to be a to be satisfied if sigma one is one, I'm gonna force these sets of constraints to be satisfied. But the key here is, for example, if we choose sigma zero as one, then we need to relax these constraints to make them redundant and same the other way around. So one set of constraints are always relaxed, the other set is in enforced. To do so, we also need to determine the maximum and minimum of this affine function v transpose x plus b. And now just to be clear, the v here, this is the weights of the neural networks, b is the bias to that specific node. Uh, the, the maximum of this I'm going to denote by y max, and I'm also going to call the minimum of this y min. This notation is not perfect because here y min might actually be negative, but I have the constraints that y should be positive. So don't get confused there. Y min just refers to the minimum of the affine function. And typically that should be negative. So bear with me. I have introduced a bit of color combination to see how this is done. So then we have these constraints and let's do these steps by step. So uh, the first one, y less than or equal to zero, this we need to, if you don't choose this disjunct, we need to relax this. So if y zero is equal to zero, then we need to allow y to take on the value y max. Very simple. If y, if we instead choose this part, make sigma zero one, then we again enforce y, y to be less than or equal to zero. The second one, we do not need to do anything about that. We can just copy because in both this chunk, in both terms of the disjunction, we have that Y should be positive. So that we can just copy there. Similarly, the, the third constraint there, we also need to add this part. If we don't choose that disjunct, then we relax it, which we do by again, that part. Same for the other thing here, nothing special really. So here we need, we should remember that Y transpose x plus b, this can be negative. So therefore we kind of need to add something to relax this part. This, the final constraint there that we can enforce all the time that will not cause any issues. Um, this is not how the formulation is usually presented. We can make it a little bit nicer. So if you now substitute in that sigma zero is equal to one minus sigma one, substituting that everywhere. And then we also find that some of these constraints are actually redundant. If we do that, we end up with these four inequality constraints, which is typically referred to as the big M formulation. Okay, this was presented in the following two papers. I think it was, it was developed kind of independent of each other. And it has been used by several people after that. So the takeaway from this is that we can represent any node in a, with a ReLU activation function by just including these constraints. Mm. Yes. Let's look at a practical example. 
because I have a gut feeling that there is going to be an exam question similar to this. At least Timo has received one. <laughs> so yeah. Mm -hmm. So consider this neural network. And of course, I mean, this, this is tiny, so don't... This is a silly example, but it shows how things work. So we have two inputs. We have x1 and x2 coming in as an input, and we assume they are both between some lower bound and an upper bound. x1 between min plus minus 10, x2 between plus minus 5, just to make them different. And the our intermediate output, so the output of the first node, node n1, is denoted by y, which is now given by maximum of f1 of x or zero. f1 of x is just, again, an affine function. And similarly, the output z is given by, again, the maximum there. Okay. So if we now look at the first node of the network, we just plug in the, the weights that I had just listed there. So this is now the output of the node and we have the bounds. So now we need to also get kind of the bounds that I refer to as y min and y max. And this is now very simple. Here we can just do bound propagation. So I will just plug in the value of x1 that makes this as big as possible. I will plug in the value of x2 that makes this as big as possible. So I plug in 10 minus five there. Then we get the biggest value that y max can take is 73. And similarly for y min, we get a value of minus 67. That's the range that the affine function can take. Uh, if we, we could use a more x1 and x2 doesn't need to be restricted to just a box, but then getting good bounds becomes a little bit more tricky. These bounds, don't, they don't have to be perfect. They don't have to be tight, but that will great. The stronger they are, it will help the solver in the end. But now if we have the bounds, we can just plug these into the big M constraints we had on the other side. We obtain the following thing here. So now we have all the need to represent the first node in the network. We continue and for the second node, we again have this expression that gives the output. Now we know that, now we just have one input to that node. So this, this becomes a lot simpler. And we know that y will be between zero and 73. So then we can again get bounds for z min and z max in a very simple way. And we end up with these big M constraints. Okay, uh, nothing, nothing really fancy here. So if you, for example, now want to find the inputs x1 and x2 that maximizes the output of the neural network, which we could do by inspection for this small silly example, but if we have something bigger, it's not trivial. But then we could formulate the following mixed integer linear program. We just maximize the output. We have all the constraints to represent the nodes. And we also say that x1 and x2 needs to be in the, in, in the intervals that we had. So, I mean, this, this is extremely easy. Uh, here, one thing that I want to mention is here, getting the bounds is a lot easier when we just have one node here. The bounds in general, we are not able to easily determine what are the best possible bounds. Because imagine if we had a second node in this layer here, if you use this ap ap approach of just propagating the bounds, then we would fully miss the fact that the output of those two nodes would not be independent of each other. So we, would, we could get a lot worse bounds than the tightest possible. But yeah, let's forget about that. So we can use this big M formulation of ReLU neural networks. And I would say in practice, it works relatively well if we have small neural networks, a few hundred nodes that we can deal with. That's not a problem. If you want to find, use it for finding adversarial examples, to avoid a lot of notation, I'm writing this in a kind of ugly form for me. So to find an adversarial example, we would basically maximize the misclassification. There are different ways we can formulate that, but that, that can be written as a linear objective. We have some big M constraints for each value, and we had the input to the neural network would be a reference image 
plus the perturbation that we are making to that image. And for the perturbation, we have some restrictions. Mm. For, for, for neural networks of relevant size, this is not, these are not easy to solve. Typically, it's easy to find a perturbation that causes a misclassification, but if the network is actually robust, so you have to solve it exactly, then this becomes quite challenging. And the main reason for this is we can have, I wrote a very weak continuous relaxation, but I would say that in practice, you can end up with an extremely weak continuous relaxation. And let me... Let me illustrate this for our two node neural network, which is again too simple to really show anything, but it kind of captures the main idea. So here, the blue surface, this represents the actual output of the neural network, how that varies with the two inputs that we have. But now when we relax, when we have the big M formulation of it, and when we relax the, in, the, inter, the binary variables to be anything between zero and one, then we don't get an exact output. Like then we suddenly the output becomes a range of feasible values. When we enforce them to be truly zero and one, then the output is unique then for a given input. But when we relax it, then the only information that we actually have is that, for example, assume we pick an input there, then the actual output would be there, but the, our, our MIP representation of it just says that we need to be somewhere between this yellow orange surface on top and this yellow orange surface above so we, so we just get these upper and lower bounds of the neural network that are very far apart especially here i mean for inputs in this range we are we basically have a worthless representation of the neural network and now remember this is I would say this is a nicely scaled example. There is no extreme coefficients. We have two nodes. So this is not that bad to be honest, but the relaxations, they get increasingly worse with the number of layers we have and with the number of nodes. So I would really say like the continuous relaxations tend to become useless to some extent. Like it, it really doesn't capture the essence of what the neural network is doing. But I said that the big M formulation kind of works. And the reason why it kind of works is really what I would like to refer to as the magic of MIP solvers. The MIP solvers are, you, ha you have seen talks about like all the components that goes into it. So even if we feed it a formulation that is actually very poor, we kind of get away by it, by all the good stuff that is going into the MIP solvers. So heads up, hats off to, to the MIP developers in the room. Uh, I'm not going to go into details, but I wanted to point you towards a bit further reading. The big M formulation of neural networks is by no means the only thing we can do. So for example, Juan Pablo Vielma and co-authors, they worked on convex hull formulations of the individual nodes, which you can also represent as just adding cuts or a different formulation. There is also works on beyond the convex hull formulation. And me and Ruth, we have been working on these part, together with Calvin and Alex, we have been working on these partition-based formulations that kind of tries to capture the best of, of both worlds there. Like I said, I don't, I, I'm not intending to go into details on this. I just want to, if you're interested, then I want to point you in a direction for more reading. There are many other things you can also do. There are SDP relaxations of neural networks and many, many other things. So just a summary here, we can embed ReLU, we can embed rel, deep neural networks with ReLU nodes just into MIP problems. We can do this for finding adversarial examples. We can also use this approach, for example, if we have a big neural network that is meant to represent meant to approximate, for example, our objective function or something like that. That can be done. Uh, these are computationally demanding. Finding adversarial examples through MIP is not cheap because we need to solve one MIP to find one adversarial example. And finding lots of adversarial examples using MIP, this is not really a feasible approach. You can generate some, but generating thousands of adversarial examples 
then you need something that is faster. And that brings me over to the next thing that I want to talk about, which is improving robustness of deep neural nets, which is kind of the, that's the title of my talk, but it, it, we went on a small detour there. Okay, so I'm coming at this from the MIP perspective. So I'm, what I mean by that is I, I know I can use MIP to find a few good adversarial examples, but I can't generate a lot of them. And the, if you can generate these kind of, the obvious next step is how can you use these to improve the neural network? And that's what we have been looking at. So what we have here is we have, we are kind of here starting from, we have a trained deep neural network that we have trained on this data set. And somehow, for example, using MIP, we are able to find a set of adversarial examples. What I mean here, these are picture, we have done this for image classification. So these are pictures that are tempered with to be misclassified by our neural network. So they should have label, feeding these through the neural network should give us label YI, but it will not. It will be misclassified as something else. So if you have these, this set of adversarial data, the obvious thing you can do is add this to your training data and retrain the neural network. That's the simplest thing you can do. That, that can work well, but if we, the setting where I'm looking at is we have, for example, maybe 10 or 50 adversarial examples. For example, in the MNIST, we have 60,000 training images. If I throw in 10 more, it will not really change anything. It will result in basically the same neural network as before. You could potentially weigh them in differently into the loss function that you could do, but that raises the question, how do you take the, how do you put a weight on them in compared to the actual training data? So instead we propose a nonlinear programming approach for this. And to do so, I need to start with a little bit of notation, unfortunately. So by capital W, I mean all the parameters for the given neural network architecture. So these are all the weights, all the biases of the neural networks. And we assume that we have some, an initial solution that is good. Like we have trained that. Uh, by C of X and W, I mean the predicted label for the input X with our neural network with the parameters W. Uh, this set of X core, this is the set of training data that are correctly classified by our initial neural network. And we also do a perturbation neighborhood. This is just an infinity ball centered around. Uh, that should be a tilde there, that should not be bar. But yeah, you, you get the point. This just defines a small neighborhood around the point. And L of W and X train, this is the loss function evaluated over the training data with our current parameters W. Okay. So I claim that ideally this is the nonlinear program that we want to solve. We would like to change the parameters in a way as little as possible. We want to have this constraint. So we want all the points X tilde to be, that we choose from the correctly classified. We want these to be we want all these to be correctly classified and we want it to be correctly classified for all possi possible perturbation within our ball here. So this is an infinite number of constraints actually. And we also want the loss function to not become worse by doing this perturbation or by doing this fine tuning. Uh, this problem, I don't hope to solve. We have, uh, this is highly nonlinear, it's non-convex, and we have an infinite number of constraints. So this I don't pretend that we can solve. This is in the ideal case. If we could find an optimal solution to this, and this might not even be feasible, but if we could find one, this would be a perfect kind of a perfect neural network. It would be robust and it would get all, all, all possible perturbations there correctly classified. Mm. But 
But what we do, yeah. Uh, that's kind of there. Uh, it, it's hidden within there, but those constraints may would make sure of it. Um, so the first step we do to, to kind of tackle this is we, instead of doing this for all possible perturbations, we just look at all the adversarial data. So we say that all the adversarial data that someone gives to us, we need to adjust the neural network to make sure that these are correctly classified. Mm, and yeah, this is still a huge non-convex optimization problem. So some of the examples we have been looking at, we have about 200,000 variables. You, we can solve problems with 200,000 variables, but the issue here is that here we have a problem that is basically non-linear in 200,000 variables. It's non-convex in 200,000 variables. So therefore I'm saying that at the moment, I don't see a hope of finding the globally optimal solution and verifying that it is optimal. But fortunately, we, we don't have to. Like, uh, if we find a, a feasible solution to this, we have already improved robustness. And in practice, I'm, I'm even happy if we find an almost feasible solution to this problem. And to solve this, we kind of developed a, an iterative linearization approach. I mean, a disclaimer, I don't think this is the best possible way to tackle this problem. But here, this is intended also as a proof of concept that focusing on this problem actually makes sense. We can improve robustness by approximately solving this problem. Mm. So let's look at how we model this. So this is actually very closely related to what Andrea asked about. We don't want to have the constraints in this form here, actually using the, classi the, the, the classification of the neural network, which is typically given by something like this. We, we take the argmax of the outputs of the neural network. We don't want to involve the argmax in a constraint. That just makes things a bit nasty. So instead, we look at the actual outputs. So for example, if we have a pair of labels or outputs i and j, then, I'm, then we know that the input x is, is as likely or more likely to, to be labeled as i, than, as i than j if the following inequality is satisfied. So what I'm basically saying for it to be labeled as label i instead of label j, then the i output of the neural network needs to be bigger than the j output of the neural network. And this we can do for all, for all pairs of labels, and we can do this for all pairs of adversarial data points that we are given. So these are nonlinear inequality constraints. These we kind of know how to deal with. We kind of know how to deal with them, but they are non, they are still huge and they are non-convex. So we want to simplify these a little bit. So the way we dealt with this is we just take a first order Taylor series expansion of both sides here to get a, a linearized version of this inequality. I skipped a few steps here just to make it fit on one line, but believe me, this is just a first order Taylor series expansion at the point W hat of both sides. So by nabla w f y. Here I mean the gradient evaluated with respect to the to the weights. Yes. So the nice thing here is that if we can generate, I like to think of these as cuts to promote correct classification of the adversarial data. But what we need to keep in mind is that the original constraint that we have here, this is non-convex. So the approach that I'm presenting here, I can't guarantee that this will converge. That's good. To, that's good to keep in mind. But in practice, it works fairly well. Mm. This is an, kind of enough to, to push the training in the right direction, but we can actually do a little bit more. Mm, these constraints here, 
we could also remember w is our actual variables here the that's the weight of the neural networks but we could actually linearize this also with respect to the input and to the weight if we linearize this also with respect to the input we could for example allow like a small perturbation of our adversarial example meaning that we are not focusing on just one adversarial example but kind of in a neighborhood i'm saying kind of because we are doing this on the linearization so it's not exact if we do this on the nonlinear constraint it would be exact but then we will again get something that we can't really work with if you do this then we linearize it with respect to both mm, the inputs and the weights we get this additional term here on the right hand side and the reason why it shows a one norm here on how much we can twist the input around the adversarial data point is this now has a nice solution like we, we don't need to worry about that so the what we have here on the red on the right hand side just boils down to this so max m this is just the largest coefficient of this vector so there is no this is trivial to deal with in practice this just becomes a small constant so if we allow for this per changes to the input we just get a positive value here mm. similarly we linearize the constraint that the loss function should not get worse uh, we end up with this thing those of you who are more familiar with nonlinear programming this just means that we can't move in an ascent direction for the for the loss function mm. so now if we put the pieces together we end up with this linearized version of the fine tuning problem again change as little as possible the linearization of the constraints that the adversarial data points should be correctly classified and a linearization that we should not make the objective function worse uh, this we can fairly easily solve this is big but Gurobi and other solvers are able to handle this quite well uh, but if we solve this one of the issues is that the minimizer to this this will in general not satisfy the original nonlinear constraints that we have but we can kind of refine it we can solve this generate more cuts solve it again generate more cuts do this iterative procedure again small disclaimer we can't guarantee that this converges but what we see in practice is we are able to improve the solution quite significantly so the main steps what we do is in iteration k we solve this linearized fine-tuning problem to get a new set of, of weights we generate new linearizations at this point and we continue and repeat the procedure here i wrote terminate on a maximal number of iterations in practice if this was convex we could guarantee to converge but even if we could guarantee to converge we would most likely need more iterations than we can really afford to wait because this is still a big problem so instead we just run this for what we have been doing in practice we have run this for 20 iterations and then we have stopped uh, we do a further refinement i'm kind of hesitant towards calling it a line search but that's what we ended up calling so what we do is we take these candidate solutions that we have obtained and we kind of search in between these candidate solutions and our original point and this is this could be done a lot more elegantly but what we do is we just pick a few points in between on that line segment the reason why we don't do it more in a more clever approach is also we we don't know exactly what we are really searching for here let me explain because we don't hope to really solve the problem so what we are instead really focusing on is constraint satisfaction and we kind of have two criteria for evaluating the quality of the points that we have where one is the maximum violation of the of these constraints and these constraints are the correct classification of the adversarial data so the maximum violation of those and the second one is the loss function over the training data we have these are typically conflicting with each other and here we use kind of the basics from multi-objective optimization so we look we only look at the pareto optimal or the 
efficient solutions. So this gives us a first filter that we can very easily throw out a lot of the solutions that are really not of interest for us. And we choose a final solution by weighted sum. How we do the weighted sum is actually not that critical because already the Pareto filter really takes care of this for us. Um, I know I'm pushing in into lunch, so I'm going to wrap this up quickly, but I want to show some numerical results that support the claim that this is an approach that makes sense. So what I will show results for is data based on MNIST, where we use a convolutional neural network. So for those, maybe, I think most of you know what MNIST is, but this is handwritten numbers between zero and nine, a very well-known data set. Uh, with this neural net, with this convolutional neural network, we get 160,000 parameters roughly that we are trying to optimize over. And evaluating robustness is actually hard. I mean, we could do it by solving one MIP for each training data point, but we have 60,000 of those, and I, I don't, I can't wait to solve 60,000 MILPs. That's going to take forever. So what we do is we use these so-called adversarial attackers. These are simple codes or simple algorithms that are intended to slightly twist your image to make sure that it's classified, that it's not classified correctly. That's what they do. It's think of them basically as using kind of stochastic gradient descent, but using them in the opposite order from what we normally do. So, yep. So basically how successful these adversarial attackers are, that is what we are going to use to evaluate the robustness. Let me explain the results. <laughs> On the first row, this is the initial trained neural network that we have trained using Adam basically, like out of the box tools for minimizing, optimizing neural networks that are well accepted. Then we get a 98.5% accuracy on the clean data, which is good. But if we then look at, if we allow these adversarial attackers to slightly change our, our images, then we go down to 15 and 4% accuracy. There are 10 categories of data points here. So going down to 4% classification accuracy, that's, that means worse than random. So, I mean, this is useless in practice, I would say. But now on the second row here, this is if we use 10 adversarial data points to adjust, to fine tune our network, we lose a little bit in accuracy on the clean data, but that loss is insignificant, I would say, and we greatly go up in accuracy on the perturbed data set. This is with different weights for the weighted sum that we use for the multi-objective for picking. You don't need to worry about this, but the interesting thing there is it doesn't really matter that much. As long as we use the Pareto filter to throw out solutions that are bad, we are good. So the big takeaway, we can use MIP to check if neural networks are robust, and we can use techniques from classical optimization to greatly improve robustness. But still, there is plenty of room for improvement. Thank you.